Emergency Room. I've been here for just over a year, 15, no, 13 months. Um, and my role, they created a half-time role, so instead of having rotating psychiatrists covering the ER and the hospital, it's me, but I'm only half-time. So with the BERT, I work closely with the BERT team, who you guys work closely with. Yes. So um, one of the things I had kind of hoped to do and look at, and I did this talk with the ER uh, physicians, and we came up with some ideas, so I'm happy. I want to also hear other ideas. Um, and we've been having a slow time implementing. One of the ideas was to create videos so we could have some consistency and we'll, we'll talk about the visual cues for patients that come in at 2 in the morning or at 9 in the morning, you know, whatever time. But um, we've been still working on getting that project going. So um, I think everybody around the, all the people who have my position, I'm on a listserv and everybody kind of talks about the increase in um, for patients waiting for beds and ERs all over, and then especially to um, for kids with developmental delays that aren't really meeting criteria for psychiatric admission. So um, we want to better understand about where these challenging behaviors come from, improve the patient's comfort and compliance, and oh, you guys have them, okay and then minimize any safety concerns for the staff and the patient and help organize the patient's encounter. Do you guys do um, triage in the room or triage in the waiting, like uh, they go from the waiting area to the triage? We have a triage station. Station, essentially. Ide ideally, at triage, we identify you know, the issues, um, whether it's um, out of control behavior or where the kid is on the level of autism, uh -huh. but also if there's any, a child may have autism but coming in from asthma. Right. So they may have other medications that right. are aggravating the situation. <laughs> that triage, normally what happens is that it's a high priority in the sense that if it's a busy waiting area, we certainly don't want this. Usually for these kids, if they're really hyper and, and anxious, it's better to get them in a room as soon as possible, private room. Dim the lights, you know, and just kind of exactly. increase the stimulation. And also, they don't like some don't like to be touched. They don't right. want their clothes to be changed. Right. Um. So oftentimes we would bring them back, and I mean, in the perfect world, we would have a nurse come to triage to bring them back. Um. Unfortunately, you know, especially when it's very busy, that's not always possible right away. And then also, it's another situation where you really don't want these patients in the waiting area. If I have a kid who had autism, we didn't have a room to get him back right away, and they were um, kind of like fighting and not sharing the crayons with the other kids, <laughs> in, and it was really uh, disruptive, disruptive for the whole the group. Pa other parents were really <laughs> concerned about that. Yeah. But, um, so it's it's really a challenge, but our priority is, is to remove them from the environment and get them into the privacy of a room. And I would imagine most of the time that happens. But right. if the rooms all As busy, or we have to move a patient to another room to give these patients a privacy, you know, it takes time. To do that. Right. Yeah. And well, I had asked at UCSF at Mission Bay, and they said that they do the in-room triage, so that that like any patient, no matter what, they're coming in. So that already allows, I think, a different type of, you know, you don't have the waiting area with all the kind of um, noise and stimulation and all that. Where do, they, where do they keep That's because they have like they a have third staffing. of the patient population. Is that what we have? I don't understand how they do that. Not even a third. That's they do that. Right. Yeah, I don't know what they do. That's they, a, yeah. they when have, I ask them about uh, this. They have, their triage is a station like ours, yeah. but all they do is arrive at the patient. And then put them in a room. And then they go directly to a room because they have their vital signs yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Dramatically different than our numbers. Right. Right. So these are just going through, thinking about, because like what you said, this talk is really thinking about not the births, because I think we, um, we probably see more kids on the spectrum who are coming in for lacerations, asthma, right, like in general. So it's kind of thinking about all of the kids. And then like you said, the spectrum is so vast, right? So it might be a lot easier to think about how you would approach a nonverbal autistic kid, but then some of these children who are higher functioning, maybe mainstream, and their impairments aren't as obvious. And then 
parents often don't disclose autism. They don't so they just say, so what's your, true. your child have any medical problems? Like, no. You know, and then, oh, they got all these services from the regional <coughs> center and all this, but that's not like a, it's not, they're not thinking about it. They're thinking about the broken arm or asthma or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just kind of thinking about what the impairments are and how that manifests for us in the, in the room. So social impairments, the, talking about unusual subjects, repeating the same question over and over again. So you might have answered it already and they're asking it again. Um, not making eye contact, it's hard to tell if they're listening, appearing aloof, failing to directly answer questions, appearing withdrawn, and then sometimes inappropriately excited um, for the situation. And this is just um, a little girl saying that she likes to talk to animals, but not to, not to people. Um, so also with communication, they're, um, they speak in a kind of monotone, pedantic rhythm. They can use scripts to converse or answer questions. So I, I worked with the boy when I was an undergrad, and uh, he loved freight trains. And we would go uh, kind of in an area where the trains would come by, and he would always, when he heard the train, he would say, are you going to get upset if it's not your favorite train? Because <laughs> that was him practicing the script, where it's like, I hear the train, I say this to try to calm myself or not to be... Or they'll say like, um, you know, hello, how are you? And they'll answer in a way from a TV show or something that's kind of appropriate but not quite typical. Um, unable to understand inferred meanings of idioms or general comments. Not able to understand jokes or sarcasm. Or in thinking and interpreting words literally. So Amelia Bedelia is the perfect example of this. She was asked to draw the drapes. And the, <laughs> she drew a picture of the drapes, which is not what the, her employer had wanted. So um, having narrow interest in repetitive behavior, strong preferred special interest, um, performing repetitive behaviors. I don't know if you've seen kids with like strings. A lot of times they'll come to my office strings or tape, and they're kind of playing with things in an unusual way. Um, and they have a hard time taking the perspective of others. And then sensory challenges, um, like you were saying about clothing. So um, preferred items or routine for comfort. And I put a tag in there because a lot of them have, have now a lot of clothes are made without tags, which is nice. But the sensitivity to the tags are strings and socks. Um, do our gowns have tags? Do our hospital clothes? It's just not a drawstring. The not. The yeah, the purple ones do. have them. The purple cotton ones. Yeah. Yeah. Have a string in the back. Oh, have a tag. Have a tag, yeah. Most of the time, I just don't have them change because they don't just need to. too stressful. Right. So difficulty processing and regulating sensory intake. So they can either be hyposensitive or hypersensitive. So a lot of parents will say, I have a really high pain tolerance. Um, I had a mom who actually, this kid was in our ER for quite a bit. Um, I don't know if you remember the little blonde boy. Caden? No. Um, with with autism, nonverbal autism. Oh right. It was like okay. twenty four hours in the in the ER. So he and then he went upstairs for like three months and then uh, I see him now outpatient. But his mom for the lab draws, we actually have a mobile lab come to his house and he tolerates it fine. He doesn't have any problem with it. But it's so stressful for him to get into a car, come to the office, have the people, you know, holding him that is stressful for him, but the actual lab draw is not a problem. Um, so that he's not sensitive to the pain of the needle, it's more just the, all the stuff that's going on around it. And then executive functioning impairments, so difficulty organizing information and routines, preferring structure and sameness, not understanding abstract concepts and thoughts. And then this is an important one, not recognizing that choices might be available if they're not specifically stated. That's not something that you know we think about often, but not knowing that they might be able to say, "Can I get water?" or "Can I?" You know, they might not be able to advocate for themselves. Basically, because if they don't see a choice, they'll not think to to mention it. Um, difficulty recognizing and interpreting facial cues, body language, voice inflection, and gestures, and they can be really overwhelmed by the way that we communicate with um, all sounds, movements. 
expressions, and then difficulty empathizing, empathizing with the emotions of others. And they're more prone to anxiety, and they have difficulty regulating their emotions, and they, we might not be able to see it from the outside until it's a meltdown. Um, so we, just like they don't see the warning signs from other people, they don't often express, have very expressive faces. So how do we correct for these uh, impairments? So, and like you said, the spectrum is such a variety and the development might be very um, varied. For the most part, most are visual learners as opposed to auditory learners. And that was our hope in trying to make videos because they can really respond, they can really get a lot of information from, from a video. And parents and guardians, as you guys know, have a lot of information on what triggers them and what soothes them. So um, we want to try to have strategies for all the patients who come in and then improve di some difficult behaviors and then the very smallest amount will have very, very challenging behavior that we're needing to kind of use medication or restraints for. So parents may forget to disclose the developmental delay. And so this, a lot of this information that I got was from Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. They do clinical pathways that are available to view online. And so they started, I heard the pediatrician give a talk on this at a conference, which is where, how I got interested in it. And um, they included it as a triage screening and the people who have done the most literature on this are dentists. <laughs> More than pediatricians. Interesting. Right, because you have to see the kids like once or twice a year and you're pretty invasive. So they said the most sensitive question was, can your child sit still for a haircut? You know, if that's developmentally an age when they should be doing that. Um, does your child have any special communication needs and any, just explicitly, any behavioral diagnosis or developmental delay? And then, um, once the patients are um, identified as being screening positive for a developmental delay, then they put blue signs on the doors of the rooms to notify anybody entering or exiting that, you know, there might be, there's some, some, something to be aware about for walking in or out of the room. So what does it say on the blue sign? It says things like, things that soothe me, things that trigger oh, me, okay. how many people I want to have in the room, or... Not like the blue side that says developmental. Well, that's what I was worried about. I was kind of worried. I don't know how their ER is set up. I know it's a newer building. I know they have, you know, it must be nice to be chopped. Um, but I, so I don't know what it looks like, but I was worried about confidentiality. Exactly. So with parents that. are very private about that. Right, right. And then to have it kind of a sign on the door but but I don't know that was something that I brought up with the doctors but I think you it's a better question for you guys as to what would be a flag but not an obvious a flag for the team but not for patients other patients that don't need to know or that the parent doesn't want to feel targeted yeah, sometimes people don't stay in their rooms other families right they walk their mom around with the kids right so that's a privacy thing or they and other families might want that special sign and they also want their, you know, none of this stuff is, none of this stuff, everything would be, is beneficial for most children, right? So, um, so here's a mnemonic, I thought it was, it's, yeah, kid, it's, I think it's supposed to be kids care. But no, maybe kids it is care. Yeah. It could be either That's way. It, it could be either <laughs> way. And what was helpful for me about doing this is that, you know, because, um, like when I was, the, the pediatricians that I was talking to, right? And you guys are pediatric nurses. And so we already know how to work with the developmental, the developmental delay because we know how to work with two-year-olds and one-year-olds. And so these older children developmentally are just behind, right? So if we just think, I think it's just being aware that that's the need that they have because they can look very typical. Um, so things like knocking and waiting before entering, allowing the child, I think this is pretty standard, you know, talk to the parents first, right, and then, the, and then engage with the child, uh, introduce yourself, know who's at bedside, being specific, concrete, and simplified. So I introduce myself as a doctor who works with thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, because the psychiatrist is not 
very helpful information to a child. <laughs> um, discussing the plan of care, breaking things down into small steps that are less intimidating. And then they thought this was helpful. They said a lot of times um, we might forget to let the parents know the plan. And if the parents have any anxiety, the kid's going to respond to that. So the more the parents can know what's happening, the more helpful that is for the whole family. Um, and then they were saying that you know some kids are even sensitive to soaps or the, uh, I don't know if you, I haven't seen this be a problem. I don't know if you guys have noticed this is a problem. That, so they were saying ask the preference if the child, you know, but I don't, I don't know how you're supposed to do that. We have to clean our hands. <laughs> But I don't think I've heard of that one. I don't think our soap is that fragrant. No, um, not supposed to be. No, I, I don't even think, think it is. And even the alcohol, you know, it evaporates so quickly. I don't really feel like it's, except for the actual putting it on, it's not really. Um, and then, I don't know if you guys move the idea band around, if they're sensitive to it on their wrist or their ankle. on the ankle. Yeah. They can't see it. Yeah, they don't move around as much. And then uh, part of the literal thinking, it's either things are present or not present, like black or white. So it's hard for them to do the pain gradient, which I know we're used to using. So it's more asking parents, like, is this their usual behavior? Is this discomfort? And where is the pain as opposed to how much is the pain? And then explaining things prior to doing them and keeping them simple. To some other, these are all things that when I read these, I was like, yeah, this is what I learned in my pediatric rotations and how you approach, you know, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, right? You're trying to look in their ears. <laughs> you can't just shove an otoscope in their ear. Um, so getting low, communicating, um, using the preferred style, um, simple concrete language, breaking things down, and then visual prompts. So I brought some examples. Children's Hospital of, uh, of Pennsylvania, they, did, they, they made their own cards, logoed cards that they have handy. and pass those around. Some of them I'm like, I don't know how that's oh, really yeah. helpful, like feeling sick or a blood pressure cuff. This is the kind of stuff I thought if we were going to do visual things, we'd want it to be specific for what our equipment looks like. What do you do? Did you show them the picture? And you would say, uh, yeah, you're feeling sick. Or for, um, you know, blood pressure cuff, there's this one that's first and then. So it's a very simple first, then. And this is what they have these cards for. So it's a very, uh, it's like the size of this. And you put first blood pressure cuff, then an apple, or then a snack, or then a treat, or then an iPad, or whatever the reward is that you can work out with the parent. So at CHOP, they have a computer available to the parents with the icons on it so the parents can go in and choose their rewards and choose. Um, I like the visual idea, but um, I think the, the pediatricians, the ED docs, were like thinking that a, a, um, you know, it's like where do you keep it, where does it wander off, where does it go, who has access to it. And, what is your child life support now? So I started this project. Maddie was ready to go on maternity leave. She's on maternity leave. Yes. <laughs> so there's so, so we have Ryan now. Yeah, we do have Ryan a couple of days a week, but um, we're at least halfway through her leave. She'll yeah. be back before we know it, I think. That's part of the reason we've had a pause on the videos because I've been having a hard time. She was super excited about the project, but I've been having a hard time. My schedule too, getting somebody else engaged because I don't have all the answers. We're trying to figure out how much it would cost to make the videos and work off. Never made a video. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the budget is. Who would watch the video? So it would basically be once it's identified that a child, so it would be a video going through the process of phlebotomy, um, sutures, uh, x-ray. There was a list, and we can add more to that list. There was a list of kind of like common nebulizer treatment, um, common procedures that they could see what was going to happen and that would alleviate their anxiety because they would know exactly what the next steps were. So that these are visual cues. This one is from Autism Speaks, which has a lot of really free, great resources. And this is, um, this would be if you, from an outpatient perspective, so not, you would say, you know, we're going to get in the car, we're going to drive, 
we're going to read a book, there's going to be, you know, we can listen to music to make us feel better, and it will say, like, you know, pull up your sleeve, wipe off arm, there's a tourniquet, spray, ice pack, you know, it will, so they have all these pictures already, but it just seemed like a harder thing to kind of implement with the standard, because everybody has different skills, and then like you said, sometimes the shift is really busy, and sometimes it's not as busy, and so just to have consistency, they felt the video, it would be on a, I think the idea was to have it on a, um, uh, like an iPad that's mounted. We have an iPad that's mounted. And then it would be in a folder, so you could just choose right. it and show. So Child Life Upstairs does a lot of these really great like social stories and visual cues to help mm -hmm. kids who are chronically in the hospital with their procedures and going through their procedures. So um, it's not, it's not, I don't think it'll be that hard of a thing. As, and they, um, Augie was saying that they have funding for it. It's just a matter of us creating a budget. So I'm like, I don't know. So it'll, it's just a process, but. Well, each room has TV, and there right. are show things like helmet safety. You could also implement a similar thing, and then have the nurse, you know, play and oh, take a look at this. Right. Maybe starting an IV, and let them look at that. I think right. the problem is showing someone well, they all were, the different pictures. Is that itself is overwhelming? Well, no. So this is right. Cards. So you know? how this works? If you were the parent, you would cut out the ones that are relevant to you, and you would make the schedule and make the story for your child. So that's why like having that child life specialist is fine, but we can't do that. I mean, we, that can't be the expectation for the staff. <laughs> like, you know, that, that's just, that's why I think the video was the solution that was more standardized and easier to access. I'm trying to remember, I saw Maddie in a video that was explaining um, the pre-op process. Okay. She had a little doll and yeah. the, um, Pre-op nurse was there and yeah. asking questions, and uh, it, I, that's what I'm envisioning that she would do a video right. of this is how breathing treatment works, yes. or this is how we start an IV and draw labs. Right, and they can watch the whole thing before we do it. So exactly, because they need less of a surprise when it happens. <laughs> they need to know what's coming because they are yeah. they are very anxious, right, and that they can't understand it. From speaking, so visually it's much better. Um, and then, so here are just some examples of how we can, if a child is using multi-word phrases or age-appropriate language, then we want to speak to the child with one or two more words per sentence than the child uses. I thought that was kind of a nice um, rule of thumb. And then nonverbal or single words, use the child's communication device if they brought it, communicate with pictures or a tablet. So that's like when these things would be helpful. But I think it's only helpful if we had, I think CHOP has a lot more child life support too. Mm -hmm. and so if we had 24 hour child life, then this wouldn't even, this would be implemented by them, right? Um, and then remember that everybody's language level drops when they're anxious. And so using simple language. Um, concrete language, so um, again, like this was something that was learned in working with children, so just being really concrete. Do this instead of hold your arms out nice and straight, um, check breathing, now I need you to take a deep breath so I can just try to eliminate all these extra words and commands and things that they would have to infer. So sit here, open your mouth, show me your stomach um, instead of these other ways that, I think this, these are all normal things that you would hear somebody say. Um, hop up on the table, open up nice and wide. I mean, these are all things I can imagine people saying. And then, so here's an example of how that first then works. So first wash your hands and then you have a snack. Um, so that's an example of how it would look, how those little cards would line up on the, on the first then really simple schedule. Um, and then here's an example, <coughs> this is what I've already shown you, this, like, the little icons that you're right, you don't just hand them the whole thing, you would do it in a story or a sequence that would be, make sense for them. Some of them, it's funny to me, because see this, like, reward, like, this blue reward, 
CHOP had that same one on theirs. I just printed out some of theirs. And I just don't know, like, is that really like a universal sign for a reward? Yeah, <laughs> like, like, how relevant is that? That's not relevant to it's our children. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think well, that's... they understand a ribbon. Right. No. Or a sticker. You know? Sticker. Exactly. Sticker. No, sticker exactly. they understand. But it's funny because Chop also did a ribbon and I was like, what are we in the country fair? Like, what is that? <laughs> I don't know what that's from. Um, and then also ways to give them choices. So I remember this from ear exams. You say, you know, um, which ear first? You don't say, can I check your ears, right? Because then they say no, and then what are you supposed to do? <laughs> so, so, you know, which ear first? Um, do you want to, I guess if they're able to walk, to an x-ray, do you want to walk or ride in the wheelchair? So they can feel like they have some autonomy, but not the autonomy to say no to a necessary treatment. Um, so this is what we we're saying, being aware of tags on clothing, maybe let them wear their home attire, which just sounds like what it happens here. Um, and then I like this, they said change the bolts if possible, but I don't think that's going to be possible. Yeah. <laughs> can you guys do the lights or is it just on? <coughs> no, we can do it. In, in, all all the rooms, in, the rooms, in the rooms there are not. There. You, they're not Sometimes dimmable, you but there's two switches that, <laughs> and so you can, dim, you can shut off one and it darkens the room below. Okay. So Otherwise, if you turn both off, the room will be dark and yeah. it's unsafe there, you know. Yeah. They are talking about letting the kids wear baseball caps, sunglasses, um, hearing, muffling, headphones, headphones. Yeah. yeah. They come in with that though, unless yeah. the families are on top of that, the, the, the glasses, the uh, music, headphones, yeah. things like that. Um, and then, as possible, like we said, depending on what the ER looks like, um, rooms in quieter corners, streamlining staff contacts, minimizing the number in the room, consistent contact at CHOP. They said that they've been able to manage it so that the whole BERT team relevant players. So let's say the pediatrician has to do medical assessment and the, there's a nursing assessment and there's a psycholo psychological, psychological assessment that they actually try to go in all together and do the assessment as quick as possible. Which here it's saying don't go in all together, but I think it just depends on what that, how many times you're asking the child the same information. Um, but I think our process is a little bit different as well. Um, and that's for patients that are primarily psychological patients rather than, like, this might be a child with autism who has asthma. Um, parents will know about food preferences. This, I, I actually hadn't thought about this until doing this talk because I also work with the kids in the hospital but trying as best as we can, as formulary allows, to have home medications be the same as what they are. So like if they take syrup at home, syrup in the hospital, pills at home, pills in the hospital. Um, and like we had mentioned before, this assessment is going to be difficult for them. So you ask if it's where it is, if it's present or not, and if the parents can tell you if it indicates distress from baseline. And then, um, as best we can, and this is when child life can be really helpful, especially on the floor, academic schedules, structuring tasks and times, positive reinforcement, praise, uh, treats if it's appropriate, um, access to favorite items, reward with short breaks, distractions, give choices. So this schedule would be too abstract for a child on the spectrum. <coughs> Get up, be amazing, go back to bed. That's not, that's not enough structure. <laughs> So um, this is not as relevant for the ED because they've already arrived. Sometimes I think maybe kids do come for planned ER visits, so just trying to do that when it's not their nap time or maybe when it is their nap time, depending on what, what will need to be done um, as best that we can, reducing wait times, minimizing repetitive evaluations, um, informing family and patient of the plan, using child life, making environmental changes, planning ahead, allowing time, using parents as models, so that's like you could put the blood pressure cuff on the parent before you put it on the child, or I used to check the parent's ears before I would check the child's ears. It was always so traumatic for <laughs> three-year-olds to get their <laughs> ears checked. Um, and let's see. Taking, oh, so if they're starting to, that's to reduce anxiety. If they're now anxious and starting to escalate, anxious or irritable or 
you know, you can tell that their behaviors are, they're not calm. Try having them take a break. Um, try changing the sensory experience, like a favorite song, texture, or toy. Child Life is going to be bringing in, they got it approved, what is this thing called? I forget what it's called, but it's this machine that has like fiber optics on it, and it has a light projector, and it's basically a really good distraction, and it's used for even adults with special needs. Um, and you can either play music or not play music. It's interesting because some of this stuff seems contradictory, like decreased stimulation, but then if you look at this thing, it seems really overstimulating. But I guess it's the way like it can project like um, fish on the wall. To make you can it have one of those up in CT. Yeah. Where they project like just different images and they just right. go around in a circle. Yeah. So they have so one of these. Type of thing. They're trying to figure out I think if they are going to get two smaller mobile ones or one bigger, less mobile one, but it's all approved and it will be coming at some point. But that's again something that Child Life uses, right? And then sometimes having another staff member might be helpful and to give the staff a break because it's not very pleasant to always, you know, I don't. I think it's really hard when you can't sue the child in kind of a, a typical way. I remember when I was in an inpatient psych unit, we had a boy with autism who needed a, an EEG, and he was just inconsolable. And you know, it didn't matter what mom did or what we did, he just cried for his whole EEG. And it, it was really exhausting and frustrating to not be able to help him feel better. Um, and then um, if there's no risk of injury or danger, um, try to ignore behaviors that are meant to get attention that aren't um, good behaviors. It's helpful just to kind of talk to the parent and act like it's not happening. I think sometimes what happens is the parents get really worried about those behaviors and they start giving it a lot of attention. <laughs> and it's harder in that situation for us to say like, oh, actually, let's just ignore this. Um, and then providing structure, changing the environment as best we can. Um, I don't know, I imagine most parents probably use screens. That's probably the most preferred act activity or uh, distracting activity. Um, slowing down, doing things more slowly, simplifying things. This is, it's pretty repetitive. Um, so now if they're, aggress if they're aggressive, so like headbanging, throwing things, biting, um, 